Thank you for joining us for the Parsha for this week, Teruma, which means offering. We now join the discussion in progress. The Parsha for this week is Teruma, which, <clears throat> which means gifts. Ve'yelveh Adonai el Moshe l'amor, daber el b'nei Yisrael, v'yekhakhu li teruma me'et kol ish asher yid vanu, levo tikhu et teruma mi, ve'zot ha teruma asher tikhu me'etem zahav ve'kesef ve'nakshe. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the Israelite people to bring me gifts. You shall accept gifts from me from every person whose heart so moves him. And these are the gifts that you shall accept from them. Gold, silver, and copper. Blue, purple, and crimson yarns. Fine linen. Goat's hair. Psalm 181. Excuse me. Psalm Psalm 81. Hear my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, if, we, if you will listen to me, there shall be no foreign gods among you, nor shall you worship any foreign gods. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not heed my voice, and Israel would, would have none of me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn hearts to walk in their own counsel. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and ter turn their hands and turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to him, but their fate will endure forever. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock. I would have satisfied you. This is the word of the Lord. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. We give thanks to you, Lord, and invite you into our presence as you have invited us into your family. We invite you this day, Lord, this Shabbat that you gave, this time to rest and remember, and a time we should continue throughout our lives to remember a great deliverance and a, and a salvation from you. As you have saved and delivered your children of, of your children of Israel from e the hands of Egypt, and as Christ has delivered us from the penalty of, of sin and its payment, we join them this day in a freedom from heaven brought by the Father and the Son and in this day we are free, and we rejoice and celebrate, and our hearts are glad, for the God of heaven has delivered us, and we do as we please this day, as free men, no longer slaves, no longer ever to be slaves, and you have taught us the right way and the true way, and we give thanks to you, Lord, and we give thanks for the spirit that remains with us, that we may continuously know the will of God, that we may do it with a willing heart. In the name of the Son, and the Father, and the Spirit, we pray. Amen. Ta Adonai Eloheinu Melo Halam, Amotse Lechem means heart. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives bread from the earth.
Barukata Adonai Eloheinu Melo Halam Berei Pri Hagapem. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us the fruit of the vine. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. The Parsha this week is kind of full of nuts and bolts. It's God talking about, it says gifts, the title of the first part is called, well this, this part is Sanctuaries and Service. And it's Teruma, which is uh, about gifts. And this is named in my particular Torah, ark, lampstand, tent, and altar. And before I start reading it so that, because a lot of it is nuts and bolts where God tells people, tells Israel and Moses how he wants the um, tabernacle to be set up, the sanctuary to be set up. And one note I'll read to you. Um... Um, before I started reading, and it's from the um, 8th verse, 25th chapter, 8th verse. And I think this sums it up, sums up the whole issue of what God is trying to do here. Because in the 8th verse, he's telling them how to do all of these things because he says that he wants them to make all of this so that he can dwell among them. And I think this is going to be uh, very significant, as you'll see as we get toward the end. I'm going to bring another scripture in for you so that we can tie it all in with Messiah Jesus, Yeshua. Uh, because, again, it appears that the theme here is that God wants to dwell with his people. And they're making a place so that God can dwell with them. And, and because he's God and he knows what place is appropriate for him, he's giving them instructions. And so when we listen to all of these instructions uh, that he gives us, and at some point I'm going to put a stop in here because it's just one, uh, um, one uh, part here in the whole Torah portion here. So I'll probably stop, um, give us a break. Um, well, hold on a minute. Let me just do one thing. And then I'll give us a break in the middle. And then we'll go ahead and we'll start. And I'll start with a little bit of the Hebrew. Ve'yelavel Adonai el Moshe l'amor deber speak to the children, speak to the Israelites saying, and tell the Israelite people to bring me gifts you should accept gifts for me from every person whose heart so moves him. And these are the gifts you shall accept from them. Gold, silver, and copper. Blue, purple, and crimson yarns. Fine linen, goat's hair. Tan ram skin. Dolphin skin and acacia wood. Oil for the lighting, spices for the anointing oil, and for the aromatic incense. Lapis lazuli and other stones for setting for the ephod and for the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, exactly as I show you the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, so you shall make it. They shall make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, 
a cubit and a half wide and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold. Overlay it inside and out and make upon it a gold molding round about. Cast four gold rings for it to be attached to its four feet, two rings on one of its side walls and two on the other. Make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Then insert the poles into the rings on the side walls of the ark for carrying the ark. The poles shall remain on in the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. And deposit in the ark the tablets of the pact which I will, I will give you. You shall make a cover of pure gold two and a half feet long, cubits, two and a half cubits long, and a cubit and a half wide. Make two cherubim, a cherubim, of gold. Make them of hammered work at the two ends of the cover. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other. Of one piece with the cover shall you make the cherubim at its two ends. And the cherubim shall have their wings spread out above, shielding the cover with their wings. They shall confront each other, the faces of the cherubim being turned toward the cover. Place the cover on the top of the ark. After depositing inside the ark the pact which I will give you, there I will meet with you, and I will impart to you from above the cover, from between the two cherubim that are on the top of the ark of the pact, all that I will command you concerning the Israelite people. You shall make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long, one cubit wide, and a cubit high. Overlay it with pure gold, and make a gold molding around it. Make a rim of hand's breadth around it, and make a gold molding for its rim about. Make from gold rings for it, four gold rings for it, and attach the rings to the four corners at its four legs. The ring, rings shall be next to the rim as holders for poles to carry the table. Make the poles of acacia wood, and overlaying them with gold, by these the table shall be carried. Make, it bowl, make its bowls, ladles, jars, and jugs with which to offer libations. Make them of pure gold. And on the table you shall set the bread of display, so to be before me always. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work. Its base and its shaft, its cups, calyxes, and petals shall be of one piece. Six branches shall issue from its side, three branches from one side of the lampstand, and three branches from the other side of the lampstand. On one branch there shall be three cups, shaped, shaped like almond blossoms, each with calyx and metals, petals, and on the next branch there shall be three cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with the calyx and petals. So for all six branches issuing from the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself, there should be four cups shaped like almond branches and a calyx of one piece with it under the second pair of branches and a calyx of one piece with it under the last pair of branches. So for all 600 branches, all, all six branches, I'm sorry, issuing from the lampstand, their calyxes and their stems shall be of one piece with it. The whole of it a mounted um, single a mounted single hammered piece of pure gold. Make it its seven lamps. The lamps shall be so mounted as to give the light its front side and its tongs and fire pans of pure gold. It shall be made with all these furnishings out of a, a talent of pure gold. Note well and follow the patterns for them that are being shown you on the mountain. As for the tabernacle, as for the tabernacle, wait, oh, hold on a minute. Let me just see if I want to put a break right here. I think I'm, I'm going to put a break right here because it's going to start talking about the tabernacle. And we can just discuss this up to here. I think that would be a good idea up to the 25th chapter and the 39th verse, and then we'll we'll come back um, to when he when they start talking about the um, the uh, uh, talking about the tabernacle, and I'll just go to my notes 
and it tells you the, uh, some of the things that out of just all these instructions what really made it so um, solemn and so gave it such importance I mean I really felt this I didn't I didn't understand all of the dimensions and I'm sure most people don't know in my commentary some of the, they say some of the Hebrew was obscure um, but they um, but they um, uh, you know just went ahead and explained what it meant and as you can see gold is mentioned a lot but one of the notes uh, as, and I'll go back to what I said at the beginning one of the notes that I made was about verse 8 when God said for them to make him a tabernacle and he gave them so that he could dwell amongst them and the Hebrew word for tabernacle is mikdash and it's called beta mikdash the house uh, um, uh, the, the, the tabernacle is called beta mikdash and kodesh in Hebrew is holy Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. So this temple that they're making is holy. Again, why? So that God can dwell among them. And just like us, and I got to even thinking about just the way our bodies are made, that our spirit can't dwell within these bodies without the body being in a certain um, form. Uh, the main form, you have to have a heart. And then you, you have to have a brain because the brain tells the heart what to do. And I'm not sure. I wish I should have probably studied just what's, what's done first when the baby is conceived, conceived, what's made first. The heart starts beating really early. So here it is. God's telling him, telling them the, 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 the place he wants them to build so that he can dwell there. Now, we may not understand all of the symbolisms of the calyxes and the gold and why it has to be just so but God knows and if God knows he knows the place where he can best dwell so it's best to and he said to follow it well to heed it well he said note well and follow the patterns for them that are being shown you on the mountain then um, I uh, put also that in my notes I said God wants to dwell amongst his creation um, Remember when in 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 um, Genesis when it says that Adam and God, uh, if uh, and I should just say this without giving the verse, but Adam and God had a relationship in the garden that Adam could could contact God at any time before the fall. He had that relationship, and so God evidently wants to reestablish that relationship with man, and this is how He's trying to do it. And, uh, oh, oh, I also put, uh, oh, I gave another scripture where, where it shows that God is, wants to establish a relationship. In the New Testament, or the Brit Hadashah, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it talks about uh, Jesus, the Messiah. And it says, he became flesh, and he is the word. And it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Here again, it shows us that God is trying to establish a relationship with his creation again. In this way that Jesus came, Jesus came and dwelt within a human body, which was his temple, so to speak, so that he could dwell among his creation. Uh, and I thought that was, the, I mean, if, you're, if, if, if nothing else, these instructions are just um, merely God, um, again, showing them what kind of place he needs in order for him to be able to dwell among his creation once again. Any, what are your thoughts? I'll open it up for you all. Now. Yeah, it's just a lot of instruction how to put the cloth, the, all the different measurements. Mm -hmm. It was real specific, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, it was kind of detailed. I looked at uh, a couple of, well, one commentary. Um, well, I'll, I'll mention that later. But uh, it talked about a, um, 
an announcement which God was making I guess when he called up Moses and gave him these, these designs but also required a response and uh, and uh, Moses has been up on the mountain maybe two this may be the third time I think and uh, the last response I hope I'm not mixing this up with the prior chapter mm -hmm. the uh, Folks said, whatever God said, we will do. Yeah. So it required a response. And yes, God wants to dwell with his people. And uh, he sets up the guidelines of how his dwell what his dwelling place will look like. Um, we haven't gotten to this one yet, but um, the early part of the verse speaks of... Uh, a free will offering, at least that's what I, I call it, a free mm -hmm. will offering. Mm -hmm. And one other thing that was interesting was said fine linen, and I, I didn't know what fine linen, I just thought it was expensive linen, but I guess it's twisted yarn, mm -hmm. which makes it strong. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the various colors, yeah, that's pretty nitty gritty and basic and mm -hmm. what they actually are uh, we may have lost what that means but I don't know if it's all that important but very it's it's very meticulous yes uh, design is what God wants very specific for I one of the notes I made again I it, it was so specific that um, it it just, it let me know that God is, God is not someone who you could just throw out a, a praise to or just give him anything. He's very specific in how he wants to be worshipped. And I think what's lost nowadays in the way bodies of believers, whether it's church, the church or the synagogues, worship him is that um, we don't we don't follow what he said in order to worship him. We have chosen what we're going to do in order to worship him. And I'll, one of my things that, is, that I always talk about, one of my things is that the church, majority of the church has said, well, we're going to meet you, worship God on the seventh day. That's just what we're going to do. And we're going to do it based on an arbitrary thing that we decided on instead of looking at the scripture and seeing when God wants to meet with us and that's just one thing there are a number of other things where the reason why we have so many denominations whether they be synagogues or churches is that man has decided well Lord I don't want to worship you in all the ways you're going to do it I'm going to pick these seven things over here and include it in our bylaws but the rest of it I'm not going to do it and so, and, but so, but when I'm looking at this, I'm seeing that God is a holy God and he's telling you exactly what he wants or requires, not wants, what he requires in order to establish a relationship. Now, we talked about this before, if a husband and wife are trying to have a relationship, why would you do something contrary to what the other partner wants if you're trying to establish a relationship? And another thing in my notes, I wrote, where it says uh, the ark that they were going to put the the pact or basically the rules uh, that we studied uh, last week that they were going to put the rules inside the the ark and again I went to John in the New Testament John first chapter fourteen verse Yeshua Jesus is called the Word and the Word is merely Torah and it and because the the word was made flesh. He, the Torah, became a living Torah encased in flesh. And God is having the written Torah put into an ark. So there's, if there's no difference. There's very much God established his relationship based on the rules, the Torah. But in Jesus' case, he, God did it just one better. It wasn't just written on paper. It was written on, in the spirit and then placed in the flesh to dwell among his 
um, creation. I'm just thinking, I don't know, maybe it's ex you've expounded on it, I don't know. I was thinking, and also Pam Pamitator was mentioning about the ark itself. Mm -hmm. And yes, the Ten Commandments being placed in the ark itself. That they were hidden, you couldn't see. But could you see? Well, you could see the ark itself, and you could see the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. You couldn't, it's as if God wanted to hide the rule, wanted us to see his mercy more so than the Ten the Commandments. Rules. So, basically, the, the, the rules, the Ten Commandments were hidden from view. Mm -hmm. What was in view was, uh, uh, was the mercy seat of God. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, when you brought up Christ, I didn't think of it until now, I don't Maybe I'll bundle it up. Mm -hmm. When Christ came, he didn't, did he really tout the law? He came as the fulfillment of the law. So he really didn't come with the Ten Commandments on his sleeve because the, the commandments were, were, uh, were f fulfilled, the law was fulfilled in him. I, I, mean, I, I don't, I, I, I'm just talking about who he, who the Torah is. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, give you an example, the Torah is, with, God gives us so many examples because people need examples. People need, they need to see patterns. They need to see the blueprint. Mm -hmm. And so the Torah is written on, not written on paper, the Torah is written on skin. Okay. On lamb skin. Mm -hmm. The words of God, of what God, and the Torah, remember the Torah, we think of rules, but also the Torah includes how how this universal world be, uh, became what it is. God spoke it. It's that story of who God is and how things came into being. Not just, the, when I say rules, I mean not just rules and how we relate to one another, but the rules of how God, God harnessed the universe. And God harnessed the universe with his rules and by speaking these words. And so that's what I mean. I don't mean, and I don't mean he, Yeshua came and, and had a, a rod of iron. No, he didn't have one this first time. But he, he, he came to show his mercy. Yes, he came to show his mercy, but he was still the Torah. He was still these set of rules, this, this set of how the universe came into being and how God wants to have a relationship with us. Yes, that's what I mean. When I, I'm not, I don't know if we're uh, in this room. I'm just saying the, the Torah itself was placed inside the ark as opposed to being written on the outside of the ark. Well, we're, which remember... Which would have easily been done. Well, well again, we're, if we're looking at the this, again, in the flesh, here we have the flesh, and in the flesh, uh, God says to Israel in Ezekiel, I know this so well, I can tell you, God says in Ezekiel, uh, 37 in particular, and he says that he, that he will um, take Israel and he will give them a heart, take their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh, and that he will write his law on their heart. Now, it's still internal. Yes, that's right. The heart is internal. But the heart, without the heart, without the heart beating, what happens when the heart stops beating? No life. No life. No life at all. So, yes, the Torah was hidden inside of the ark, the body, they carried it. The Torah, and, and the, the fleshly body was this, this Torah, this Torah that became flesh, was hidden inside this flesh, because the flesh was corruptible. The ark was corruptible. It was made of wood and gold, but inside was what kept the universe beating, is God's word. That's what. And that's why there. That's why it's, it's basically no difference. It's God wanting to dwell with His creation and wanting to establish a place so that He can dwell. And in the case of Jesus Yeshua, what did God do? He what? He took a virgin. Right. Well, He could. He wouldn't dwell in a place without. Um, without His standards. Without exactly knowing uh, Ex how. What, what was required for him to live there. Exactly. And exactly. what we needed for of him to live to, with us, exactly. we needed his mercy. 
and um, exactly. he needed to tell us that hey, there are certain rules, exactly. or commandments, or words, or you need to live by in order for me to live here. And so we're going to stop here, but you just completed the whole story right there. Because again, if we're equating, and once I say this, then we're going to stop for a break. Here is God is giving the rules and regulations of how he wants things placed so that what he can do, he can dwell amongst his people. That's all this is. God is, it's, it's almost like you're, um, you're expecting a baby. And you don't just bring the baby home and there's nothing. Baby needs a place to lay. Baby needs food. And that's just a simple thing. But here's God saying, the God of the universe will say, okay, I'm going to come and dwell among you. But this is what I require to be in your presence. Here, Yeshua came and dwelt among us in what? In flesh. Now, what does that say about the flesh that he dwelt in? Okay, we'll stop here and then we'll go on. Not really Almost knocked it off. There's a word you normally use from time to time. What's that? But I don't know if I've heard you say it tonight. I may still say it. Verse 21, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the, the testimonies that I will give you. So what did the mercy seat represent? In a word. I don't know what. They use it a lot. It was a covering. Oh, for sin. Well, no. Well, this is a covering for the ark. Oh, oh. But yeah, but yeah, you. I'm just saying. What we need is a covering. Yeah, it, it does. It does. It does. Um, show that the child carried him, and it says, and uh, it says also where he said he would meet Moses between the cherubim. There's a song between the wings of the cherubim, and that's where God said he would meet him. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and read praise and mercy, praise and mercy which, is, which, is what, which is what God is, God is extending an olive branch, so to speak. Maybe we'll understand that. God is saying that, yes, you sinned, and we had a relationship in the garden before you sinned, but I'm extending you an olive branch. I'm showing you how to return to me. I'm showing you the way you need to do it. And instead of Instead of us accepting the way he's doing it and, and, the, and the instructions he's giving here is, an, is a, an example of what he requires. He's, he's nailing, he's um, listing the blueprint that he is designing so that we can return to him. But what does man do? Man says, well, I can do it better. I'm not going to follow your blueprint, God. I'm going to follow this one we made over here and it has nothing the one that we make has has no saving value because we're not the god of the universe we, we we're using the same old blueprint that we use in order to fall away from god so how can you possibly design a blueprint that would take you back to him if the only thing you know is sin and so that's basically what's happening here i believe that the, that the instructions mean more. Yes, he's laying out exactly what he wants. But he's also, God, God made us and he knows what we need. We need to be told exactly. We may not follow it, but we need to be ex told exactly what needs to be done in order to make this place so that he can dwell with us. And so we'll go on 
and we'll um, to the next part and I'll continue reading on until the end and again it's again a lot of a um, lot of blueprint detail but think of this again that God is showing us what he needs in order for us to dwell with him and also we will talk about Jesus or Yeshua what needed to be done in order so that he could dwell with us As for the tabernacle, we're on verse 1, 26. As for the tabernacle, make it of ten strips of cloth. Make the, these of fine twisted linen of blue, purple, and crimson yarns, with the design of carol being worked into them. The length of each cloth shall be twenty-eight cubits, and the width of each cloth shall be four cubits. All the cloths to have the same measurements. Five of the cloths shall be joined to one another, and the other five, five shall be joined to one another. Make loops of blue wool on the edge of the outermost cloth of the one set, and do likewise on the edge of the outermost cloth of the other set. Make fifty loops on the one cloth, and fifty loops on the edge of the end of the cloth of the other set, the loops to be opposite one another. And make fifty gold clasps, and couple the cloths to one another with the clasps, so that the tabernacle becomes one whole. You shall make claws of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. Make the claws eleven in number. The length of each cloth shall be thirty cubits, and the width of each cloth shall be four cubits. The eleven claws to have the same measurements. Join five of the claws by themselves, and the other six claws by themselves, and fold over the sixth claw at the front of the tent. Make fifty loops on the edge of the outermost cloth of one set and fifty loops on the edge of the cloth of another set. Make fifty copper clasps, and fit the clasps into the loops, and couple the tent together, so that it becomes one whole. As for the overlapping excess of the cloths of the tent, the extra half cloth shall overlap the back of the tabernacle, while the extra cubit at the other end of each length of the tent cloth shall hang down to the bottom of the two sides of the tabernacle and cover it. And make for the tent a covering of tanned ram skins, and a covering of dolphin skins above. You shall make the planks for the tabernacle of acacia wood upright. The length of each plank shall be ten cubits, and the width of each plank a cubit and a half. Each plank shall have two tins parallel to each other. Do the same with all the planks of the tabernacle. Of the planks of the tabernacle make twenty-four planks on the south side making forty silver sockets under the twenty planks, two sockets under one plank for its two tenons, and two sockets under each following the plank for its two tenons. And for the other side wall of the tabernacle on the north side, twenty planks, and with their forty silver sockets, two sockets under the one plank, and two sockets under each following plank. And for the rear of the tabernacle to the west, make six planks, and make two planks for the corner of the tabernacle at the rear. And they shall match at the bottom, and terminate alike at the top inside one ring. Thus shall it be with both of them, they shall form the two corners. Thus there shall be eight planks with their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under the first plank, and two sockets under each of the other planks. You shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the planks of the one side wall of the tabernacle, five bars for the planks of the other side wall of the tabernacle, and five bars for the planks of the wall of the tabernacle at the rear to the west. The center bar halfway up the planks shall run from end to end. Overlay the planks with gold, and make their rings of gold as holders for the bars, and overlay the bars with gold. Then set up the tabernacle according to the manner of it that you were shown on the mountain. You shall make a curtain of blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and fine twisted yarn. It shall have a design of a cherubim or cherubim worked into it. Hang it upon the four corners of acacia wood overlaid with gold and having books, hooks of gold and four sockets of silver. Hang the curtain under the glass and carry the ark of the pact there. Behind the curtain so that the curtain shall serve you as a partition between the holy and the holy of holies. 
Place the cover upon the Ark of the Pact in the Holy of Holies. Place the table outside the curtain and the lampstand by the south wall of the tabernacle, opposite the table, which is to be placed by the north wall. You shall make a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and fine twisted linen done in embroidery. Make fine five posts of acacia wood for the screen and overlay them with gold, their hook being of gold, and cast for them five sockets of copper. You shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar is to be square and feet three cubits high. Make its horns on the four corners, the horns to be of one piece with it, and overlay it with copper. Make the pails for removing its ashes, as well as its scrapers, basins, flesh, hook, and fire pans. Make all of its utensils of copper. Make it for it is a grating of mesh work in copper. And on the mesh, make four copper rings at its four corners. Set the mesh below under the ledge of the altar so that it extends to the middle of the altar and make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood and overlay them with copper. The poles shall be inserted into the ring so that the poles remain on the two sides of the altar when it is carried. Make it hollow of boards as you were shown on the mountain, so shall they be made. You shall make the enclosure of the tabernacle on the south side a hundred cubits of hanging of fine twisted linen for the length of the enclosure on that side, and with its twenty posts and their twenty sockets of copper, the hooks and the bands of the posts to be of silver. Again, a hundred cubits of hangings for its length along the north side with its twenty posts and their twenty sockets of copper, the hooks and bands of posts to be of silver, for the width of the enclosure on the west side, fifty cubits of hanging, with their ten posts and their ten sockets. For the width of the enclosure on the front, or east side, fifty cubits. Fifteen cubits of hanging on the one flank, with their three posts and their three sockets. Fifteen cubits of hanging on the other flank, with the three posts and their three sockets. And for the gate of the enclosure, a screen of twenty cubits of blue, purple, and crimson yarn, and fine twisted yarn done in embroidery, and with their four posts and the four sockets. All of the posts round the enclosure shall be banded with silver, and their hooks shall be of silver, and their sockets shall be of copper. The length of the enclosure shall be a hundred cubits, and the width fifty throughout, and the height five cubits, with the hangings of fine twisted linen. The sockets shall be of copper, all the utensils of the tabernacle for all of its service, as well as all of its pegs and all the pegs of the court, shall be of copper. And here we have a God who is so precise that he is making, instructing how to make the tabernacle so that he can dwell. And in my note, again, we, there's the Hoth Torah that is, and I'll tell you what the Hoth Torah, there's, with the Torah portion, there's usually a Hoth Torah. We don't usually uh, talk about it. But this week, just to give you an idea of what the Hoth Torah is, remember the Hoth Torah when the Jews were being persecuted, they were not allowed to read the Torah. And so they would um, uh, read from the prophets and other parts of the Bible. And this week it's taken from 1 Kings, where Solomon is building uh, the, fir the uh, first temple. And it uh, goes into the same detail where he's... Uh, I mean, where he's gotten precise detail, a blueprint, so to speak, of, of how he's supposed to, um, to build the, the, um, the, the Beit HaMikdash, which is, means the tabernacle. And the ark, one of the things I thought, if, we, if hopefully you didn't miss that, is when they were going to have a, a paraket, which is a curtain that separates the ark, because the ark was going to be in one room, from the, there's the holy, and then the holy of holies. And the ark is where the holy of holies would be. So this was going to be super holy. I think only the high priest was allowed to go into there on Yom Kippur. And it's called a paraket. And the, uh, 
uh, let me read, I made a note of the Haftor 6 and 1st Kings chapter 6, 13 and let me, 6, 13. It says, again, it says why God wants all this to be done. And why does he want it to be done in, in um, Kings chapter 6, 13, 1st Kings, let me just make sure. First king, he says in chapter in verse 13, I will abide among the children of Israel, and I will never forsake my people Israel. God wants all this done so that he can abide with his people. That's what this is all about. That I mean, and that's why it's so momentous. And that that's why you we should just look at this and say, okay, now what does he want? Because wouldn't we all want God to reside? There's so many people who are trying to find God and say, God, be with us, be with us. Well, he'll be with you if you make the environment so that he can be with you appropriate. And one of my other notes I have, I put down, is preparing a place for God to dwell. Again, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, are you sure? Our bodies are made clean. And in 1 Corinthians 3.16, it says, Paul says, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Now, here we go from doing a, a portable uh, Beit HaMikdash, portable tabernacle. Then uh, Solomon does a permanent one, semi-permanent one. But Yeshua comes so that what? That our bodies can become can become a temple. Now, from you get all you get from the point where in this week that he's given all this instructions to make a, a building so that God can dwell with us. But by accepting Yeshua's sacrifice, our bodies become a temple of God. And then he can dwell in our bodies if 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 we are clean. And that's the purpose of the sacrifice of Jesus, because God cannot dwell in a temple that does not meet these requirements, as he said out here. And so I'll open it up for you all right now, and then I'll go on and tell you a few other notes that I made. No, one, one side comment I had was that, uh, well, actually, as I was reading, let me mention this one first. I wonder when God gave him the instruction, did he show him a picture of what it should look like? Because it said something as I'd shown you on the on mountain. On the mountain, yes. So did he see some kind of a vision? Of a of vision. It? I would imagine uh, he did. Probably so, because he'd have to have an awfully good memory. I would imagine. He told he that, and he could uh, just remember it. I'll just take the measurements. Mm. Yeah. That um, he visualized. In, in Revelation, it talks about John, remember? That John saw the holy city, mm -hmm. that John saw the new Jerusalem. Yeah. So I can imagine Moses did see that, that God did give him. And, and remember also that according to some of the, the, the um, um, rabbis and whatever, and also like in, in Revelations, that all of these dimensions and things like that are things that are in the heavens. That Moses, that this wasn't a new thing, that the, this is what's in the heavens. This is how God's temple looks in heaven. And he's just trying to recreate it on earth. Yeah, but Moses wouldn't, wouldn't have known that. We saw a vision. He said God showed him on the mountain. Oh. He was up there for 40 days, 40 nights with him. Mm -hmm. He was watching TV with God. God TV. Well, I still had good memory to remember that for sure. Well, it's the Holy yeah. Spirit. God's spirit. You don't think Moses had anything to do with that? God's spirit was that God Moses, I mean, God's spirit was was helping him to remember. He couldn't do it on his own. Right, no. Right. Right. Uh what other thing? Um oh gosh, I, I knew there was something else about Moses and the uh remembering the patterns are the very intricate, intricate details of it. 
No, if that was it, maybe, I don't know, I got the impression that maybe he, he did see a picture of yes. it. Yes. And was able to remember it, or just had a good memory too. But the way it reads, it, it's as if he saw a picture. He saw, yeah, see, I would imagine he did. Such a magnificent, and, and, and be able to conceptualize it, I, that God showed it to him. Whether God took him to heaven or whatever. Mm -hmm. it, it, it a very crisp picture. I mean, crisp, <laughs> yes, almost, it was. Almost like you have these now, these um, smart TVs. Mm -hmm. how, how the picture so bright and everything is so detailed. Mm -hmm. that would, yeah, God is God. He could do, I mean, God, smart TV, God is God TV. God got some stuff we, and um, I wrote down um, Revelations 21, 22. It says, it says, well, I'll tell you what, let me, let me read, I'm going to read, I'm just going to read Revelations 21. It, it's, it's 27 verses, but it, it also, I think it, it matches this. It says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is John speaking. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them, and he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall no longer be any death. There shall be there shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done, and I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Taf in Hebrew, and the beginning and the end. And I will give to you the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, and the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and immoral persons, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the bride and the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels and names were written on them, which are those of the tri 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There are three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 fountains, foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. And the city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its walls, 20, 72 yards, according to the human measurements, which are angel also angelic measurements. And the material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonic, sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. 
and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and this lamp is the Lamb. And the nations shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. And in the daytime, for there shall be no night there, its gates shall never be closed. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And there's another verse I'd like to read from John chapter 2, 19. I'm just going to go to it. I wrote it down, but there's possibly an additional verse I wanted to tell you about. John 2, 19. And, okay, and it says, And Jesus was talking to them, talking, um, read, read the 18th. The Jews therefore answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us, seeing that you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews therefore said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And Also, I'm going to read First Chronicles 17. When David wanted to build a temple, he wanted to build the temple. And um, the Lord wouldn't let him build it. And there's 16 verses here I just want to read, and I think that'll do it for me. This is how, when I read it today, it was so, it was just absolutely marvelous. And this is 1 Chronicles 17. And it came about when David dwelt in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I am dwelling in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under curtains. Then Nathan said to David, Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. And it came about at the same night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant. Thus said the Lord, You shall not build a house for me to dwell in, for I have not for I have not dwelt in a house since the day that I brought up Israel to this day, but I have gone from tent to tent and from one dwelling place to another. In all places where I have walked with all Israel, have I spoken a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built for me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you say to my servant David, Thus said the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be leader over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a name like the name of the great ones who are the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them and they may dwell in their own place and be moved no more. Neither shall the wicked waste them any more as formerly. Even from the day I commanded judges to be over my people, Israel, and I will subdue all your enemies. Moreover, I tell you that the Lord will build a house for you and it shall come about when your days are fulfilled that you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up one of your descendants after you and you shall be uh, you shall be of your sons uh, who shall be of your sons and I will establish establish his kingdom. He shall build for me a house, and I will establish his throne forever, and I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my loving kindness away from him, as I took it from him who before you, who was before you. But I will settle him in my house, and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. According to these words, and according to all these, this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Then David the king went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me this far? Um, I think in this, the way this was written, I think the 
uh, author, um, the, the way it's translated, because usually when they translate it, if they're talking about uh, God, they'll capitalize his and all that. They didn't do that here when he was talking about his. But it's clearly to me that the Lord God is talking about Yeshua, Jesus, that his throne will be established forever. And that's the house that he's building up for David. And when he says that uh, he will be my son, uh, I think a lot of people thought this was Solomon, but this is this has eternal um, consequences here. When God is talking about this eternal house and this eternal tabernacle that he is building and that he's the author, he has the design for it and that he's using his son, Jesus Yeshua, in order to accomplish it. And so the Torah portion, which talks about the, uh, the measurements for this, for that, how things are going to be done in gold and all of that, it's really talking about a much more eternal tabernacle, as Revelation has said, that the, the, the God and his son shall be the temple and, and to dwell amongst his people will be their temple, I think it says. Um, but he was speaking of the temple, yes. So this Torah portion is, a, is much more than them building just a physical tabernacle. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what God is trying to do is to dwell amongst his people, as Revelation said. He's merely trying to, again, he's trying to make, go back to the beginning when he dwelt with Adam, when he was there. Adam, he, Adam had his full attention until the fall. And God's trying to bring that all back where we will be, he will dwell with us again, that he will walk with us again on this earth. And, but there, but again, we have to abide by his rules, abide by his blueprint. Our blueprint won't do it. Nothing we could do could bring this about. We're sinful creatures. We messed it up the first time. By merely, by doing, continuing to do what we want to do, we're going to mess it up again. We have to do it the way God directs us to do that. I open it up. I don't know if I can add much more to that um, than what has already been uh, covered. Um, I suppose I could go back to the willing heart, but that goes back to a choice. Mm -hmm. We choose to live with God. And, yes. And, um, he tells us how the living arrangement is uh, set forth. Yes. And uh, even knowing that, we're incapable of living with God on, on his terms um, without his mercy. Yes. But we still have the guidelines we use. But um, and I remember, there is one thing I, meant, meant to, meant, I wanted to mention that God is not our dictator. You know, he just doesn't give us laws and say you got to live by him and that's it. Uh, it's the kind of... Uh, it, we need his mercy uh, to continue, and we continue to need his mercy, although he doesn't, as I said before, he doesn't show us the Ten Commandments. They're hidden. What's a, what is seen by us is his mercy, and also uh, he is a God that is, that is serious. Yes. Yeah. Yes. These, these, things are, these things are important to him what uh, put in a temple are precious things. I guess as you proceed through the temple, the, uh, the value of the, the items increase from yes. bronze to silver to gold. Yes, yes. Um, the one place about the showbread, I don't think we talk much about that, some of the other things. Mm -hmm. But there is, um, there is structure to God, yes. which is just not willy-nilly. Yes. And we just can't do as we please. Yes. Uh, we do what pleases him. Yes. I'll put it that way. Yes. I don't know if I have much more to say than that. But that was a lot. There is structure. 
and 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 when we when we finally realize it, that there is structure that we cannot offer up uh, just anything. The uh, uh, one of the scriptures from the Bible says to God says to obey is better than sacrifice. He wants to be obeyed. And and clearly there are benefits in him obeying. You read from the Psalms today when they said, if if you will obey me, I will do away with all of your enemies. Mm -hmm. The only thing the only thing is just have to obey me. Mm -hmm. But what but we have chosen to go our own way and say we'll all, only obey you to this extent, Lord. And we're gonna add our others our own stuff to the rest. And, and God said, No. No, that's why we have to give it all to him. All say yes, we and that's what that's what accepting Yeshua's sacrifice is all about. It said, "Yes, we will obey you." I know. What I used to think uh, when I was younger that it was all about a bunch of rules and you know who wants to obey a bunch of rules and stuff like that. But it's not. We you know it's yes. It's about a, an outline that God gives us on how to live on what keeps us healthy because He made us, He designed us, so He knows what keeps us healthy, what keeps this flesh healthy. If we don't um, uh, do sinful things with it, then we're going to be healthy, and, and that keeps us living. So yes, he's telling us that. That's what. But it's it's about again how to have a relationship with him, mm -hmm. and that's what. And 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 the thing is, we don't have to. Uh, I think uh, Moses said he said we don't have to go up into heaven because it's so far away. It's here. God wants to come down here. And have a relationship. We don't have to build a rocket ship to go to the moon to have a relationship with God. He's He's willing to come here. He came here, and He will be coming back to see for those who want to have an eternal relationship with Him. For those who say yes, I want to have a eternal relationship. And yes, I I choose you. Yes, I choose to obey you. Yes, I choose you. And so that's. That's what this is about. Anything else? Okay. Next week, I'll tell you what the Torah portion is. Okay. Okay, we're in Tetzol, 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 Instruct, Veata, Tetz, Tetz, Tetzave, excuse me, Tetzave et Bene Yisrael, Veyahu Elecha. Shemen Zayed. You shall further instruct. Hmm? Instruct, yes. Commands, yes. Instruct, command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of beaten olives for lighting. Yes, commands. Again, rule, they're different. They're different. And, and I'm going to look up and see what this, how this is different from uh, instructions because we have um, Mishpatim was an instruction. And this tetzave, this may be more. I wonder if this is a command. I'll look it up because there are a couple of different words, but it is a command. It is a different, but it's a different Hebrew word they're using for a command. So I'll look it up to see. What chapter is this? Uh, it's Exodus 27. Oh, thanks, very good. Thank you. 20 through 30 and 10. 27. So we, we're again they're dealing with the the different things of, of let's see, I think the wearing the perpetual light, the priests and their vestments, um what they should wear. And this is uh, remember uh, when we were in Israel John we went um, they were. Uh, we went to the t um, Temple Institute, and they had all the clothes. Do you remember? Oh, uh, I think clothes. Clothes for the, the priests. The, if you 
Thank you for joining us for this week's Torah portion discussion. And next week, we hope to see you then to discuss the new Torah portion. We thank you for